Hello and welcome to another edition of Geek's Got Game in the River's Edge studio at the Millvale Studios. I'm your host, Matt Geica, and also thank you for watching on Facebook Live. Great to have you alongside for another Friday afternoon or morning or evening, whenever you happen to be listening on this, well, what is it? Look at the calendar, December 9th, 2016, smooth transition. It's great to be back in Pittsburgh as well, as I spent the last four days, four plus days, in Washington, D.C. for the Major League Baseball Winter Meetings, a truly bizarre and frantic event, if you know where to look and uh, which places to dig into. I'll get into that in my opening argument for this week's show. Also coming up later, I marvel at a childhood idol of mine still getting it done in the NHL at an advanced age. You can probably guess who it was, considering who the Penguins played on Thursday night, but... That's not going to stop me from offering up another homage to his greatness. So maybe you'll forgive a little bit of redundancy. I think I've talked about uh, this man before on the show, but not to this extent. And it'll be part of the final number segment right at the tail end of this week's episode. For those of you who don't know me, who have not watched this show before, I am Matt Geica, and I am a reporter, analyst, and podcaster for DKPittsburghSports.com. But more relevantly to you right now, I am one of the weekly hosts right here on the River's Edge, which is a new kind of radio, as you may already know. And you can find us streaming live, you may have already found us streaming live, at River's Edge, PGH.com. And I mentioned the Facebook Live aspect, we like to do that. Uh, with each of our original shows, of which we have several right now. So uh, good to have you aboard. No matter how you may be accessing the show, we have the live stream at riversedgepgh.com. That's where you can find my archive shows. That's where you can find Brian Crawford's River Talk archive programs. Funny Money is also on the docket. So is Bold Nights Out. The list goes on and on, and it's all right there on our website. And uh, also on YouTube, there are video archives. We have some shows broken down into individualized, specified clips uh, that can be more easily digestible for you than the entire episode, although we have those too. So we aim to please. We super serve you here at the River's Edge. And every morning or afternoon or evening, whenever I end up recording this show, we are live though on this Friday, but every time I come into the Millvale Studios, I, I see the literal art that's being produced in uh, the front of this building and may look a little run down on the outside. No offense to our gracious hosts here in Millvale, but uh, there's so much going on, so much vibrant activity on the inside. We've got pottery being displayed out in front, uh, more traditional art forms in the back right now, some canvas painting, that sort of thing. So it's an inspiration to walk past all of that and to see people still producing old-school art instead of the kind of new-school art we're trying to produce uh, each and every day here in the back. And, and they have us in the back of the, the studio, so it's, it's humbling to be attached to that type of a project. And I'm reminded how new-school, though, this business that I'm in is, and I've been in it for more than a decade now since I uh, got into... Uh, baseball, in fact, and that'll tie things together. I worked in the world of baseball to start my sports career while I was in the midst of my senior year at Marshall University. Well, it will be 11 years ago this upcoming summer, so uh, we are more than a decade past it. But my past met my present in Washington, D.C., and in particular, National Harbor, Maryland, where the winter meetings were taking place. And if you're not familiar with what the winter meetings are, if the, the title doesn't tell you a little bit about it, it is a convention, essentially, of the entire baseball world. Not just Major League Baseball, but the hundreds of minor league organizations and the companies that serve them that help provide promotional materials, equipment for video boards. I'll get to that in a moment, but... Uh, so there's a job fair, there is a trade show, and it's much more than the, the glitz and the glamour 
and the cloak and dagger that you you hear about regarding trade rumors and uh, free agent negotiations that all go on under the same roof. And we were at the Gaylord National Resort, in fact, this time around, and a beautiful place to be on uh, a pretty cold week in in Washington, D.C. Warmed you up a little bit just being in there and, and talking about the summertime sport. And uh, what is bizarre, as uh, I talked about right at the top of this show, what is bizarre about the winter meetings is the the clash of cultures, if you will. The TV sets, MLB Network, ESPN doing live shots right in front of the media workroom. So if you saw me walking by, uh, then you were not alone, I'm sure, as these meetings generate the most buzz of the offseason in Major League Baseball. And I wasn't above a, a video bomb or two along the way to doing my job for DKPittsburghSports.com. You can find all of that at the Pirates page. So you have MLB Network, ESPN, a whole bunch of regional sports networks from New York, from Toronto, north of the border, from Boston, Houston, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, Root Sports did not have a presence there, but KDKA TV was there with uh, Rich Walsh coming for the final two days when rumors about Andrew McCutcheon potentially moving on, as I talked about last week here, did not come to fruition, but... Uh, things were heating up, and the hometown Nationals, the Washington Nationals, were seeking McCutcheon services. So all of that goes on, at least as it was this week, on the top floor of the uh, Gaylord National Resort, the, the top floor of the convention center, at least. Uh, the hotel stretches up and up. But uh, as far as the public access floors, right at the top was what people think about when they think about the winter meetings. But Underneath, maybe appropriately, uh, below, in not in the basement, but in the lowest level, was all the minor league uh, comings and goings that I discussed earlier, the job fair, the, the trade show, and hundreds of eager job seekers, mostly 20-somethings, although a few 30-somethings and 40-somethings too. I don't want to be ageist. All of them required to wear an ID badge that says job seeker right on the front, so uh, it's very clear why these people are in Washington, D.C., in the Capital District, to, in some case desperately, seek out a job in sports and a job in baseball, to be specific. And to get access to the job fair, you had to pay at least $200, if not $250. So there's some capitalism at work in order to have the right to apply for some of these jobs in person, which are available online in the most in most cases. But in order to make that impact in person, you have to pay money, even though you're ostensibly applying for a job because you don't have much money. So there is a tinge of extortion to the event as well. And uh, that's, uh, again, adds to the bizarre nature of it, the counterintuitive feel at the winter meetings. So you have the major leaguers. You have the, the big TV personalities, your Harold Reynoldses, your Brian Kennys uh, on the ESPN side, Busteroni. Pedro Gomez, Tim Kirkchen, uh, they're all there under one roof to try to figure out exactly what's going on behind closed doors. And in, in a lot of cases, uh, these people have great sources that tell them what goes on behind closed doors. And uh, I'll get to the word source, in fact, in my Kill the Cliché segment later in this program. But you have all of that going on upstairs. What most baseball fans are paying attention to, why I was there for our website, is to report on what in particular, the Pirates are trying to do to reshape their roster for the 2017 season and beyond. And then below all that, and really the main event, because the minor leagues host this event and they invite the major league teams to attend. So uh, again, counterintuitive in a lot of ways. But uh, there you are on the bottom floor, waiting your way through the job seekers and, and people um, just trying to get a foot in the door, and you can appreciate that. I was there 10 years ago, as I mentioned, my first job in baseball, intern for the West Virginia Power, now the Pirates' low-A affiliate. At that time, they belonged to the Brewers, and uh, located in Charleston, the capital city of West Virginia, and I was happy to work in a, a, what was almost a brand-new ballpark, Appalachian Power Park. We may call it the Appalachian Mountain Chain up here in Pittsburgh, but in real Appalachia. It's called the Appalachians. So there you have it, a bit of a 
regional diction lesson for you uh, on this edition of Geek's Got Game. Not afraid to delve into that anyway. But uh, that was my entry point into sports. That's why I'm here, in fact. And uh, back in Pittsburgh, covering the Pirates, the team I grew up rooting for, and uh, also chipping in on other Pittsburgh sports coverage. But baseball is where I started, even though I wanted to get into hockey, and I eventually did. But baseball was my entry point, and I'll be forever grateful for those opportunities that I got. In fact, my uh, girlfriend at the time, now my wife Jillian, whom you've met on this show in the past, she helped me gain uh, a foot in the door there in Charleston. As she had an internship first, she realized they were looking for someone to do some audio video work, and I was certainly up for that at that stage, looking for any kind of avenue to advance my professional career or really get it started. Uh, right there as, uh, again, the word desperation. As you're leaving college, you uh, need to find a spot to go, and you want to find something to do that's interesting, and and I was fortunate enough to to have that. Plenty of hard work, plenty of long hours, 10-game homestands, being there from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. and beyond uh, many times, but uh, you hear about paying your dues. I think that was a, a major uh, factor in, in why I was willing to do that was because I knew that I was putting a down payment on perhaps other opportunities down the line. And so I saw all these job seekers that were in my position a decade ago, and then I, I thought about where I have been, uh, in a lot of cases, lucky enough to advance to and to get opportunities to be covering a major league team. And I'm not sure I ever thought myself to be a beat reporter for uh, a big league ball club, but here I am. And uh, I am enjoying it quite a bit, and, and I do not uh, lose the, the, the marvel, the, uh, the gratefulness, the gratitude to be where I am. And an event like the one that I just attended for the better part of four days reinforces all of that, and, and uh, it brings it full circle, and I'm always one to try to appreciate how far I've come and how maybe far I, I have yet to go. It's also a very intimidating event for someone like me. It was just my second winter meeting, so uh, you try your best to sum up and distill what happens there and, and make sources, make connections in order to fill out the coverage. So uh, I feel like I, I did some exclusive reporting in addition to some boots-on-the-ground, man-on-the-street type of uh, investigation, too. And I didn't just write about what the Pirates did. I wrote about some fascinating new physiological research that I'll discuss uh, later on in this program, perhaps. Uh, that's all come out in the world of baseball due to a study last year. That was fascinating, so it wasn't just hot stove stuff uh, that can be covered at the winter meetings. But also, I wrote about what I'm talking about exactly in this first segment of the show, which is the juxtaposition of uh, the big leagues and all those people there making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars working in the industry, and then those who are just happy to have an unpaid internship if it comes down to that, or making 15K or 10K over the course of a summer for the privilege of working full-time plus hours and, in a lot of cases, not doing very glamorous work, pulling tarp, cleaning up concession stands. Uh, the list goes on and on, and that regard and and believe me I can tell you firsthand all the the things that I did that I didn't think I would be doing setting up uh, a a video uh, set setting up a tv set for uh, a program so um, nothing too uh, glamorous nothing very out of the ordinary or flashy or or anything that you would most likely uh, see any student reach out for and, and try to and try to get but uh, that was what was available, and that's what I took. And so when I saw all those youngsters, in most cases, at the winter meetings at the Gaylord Resort, uh, then I was taken back. It was uh, a past meets present type of moment, and it uh, it validates in a lot of ways that decision I made way back when to not go into journalism right away, which I ended up uh, in a roundabout way back into, but to try to work in sports. That's what I wanted to do, to be around sports and it's panned out fairly well, and uh, so to all those folks that I saw at the winter meetings, uh, trudging around, frantically searching their phones perhaps for uh, an opportunity to meet up with someone who might be able to advance their career, I wish you all the best of luck. I'm praying for you, and uh, just take it from me, a humble start 
can uh, be exactly what you need, can be the only way in, and uh, don't make it too much of, uh, of a thing where you take it to heart. Sometimes you have to shovel some crap in order to, uh, to get to where you want to go in this industry and many others. You're watching Geek Scott Game. As I go far afield in the opening segment, sometimes that happens on this program. We like to take a bigger picture in addition to zooming in on the details. When I come back, I will go into the concept of the hot stove and trades and all the off the field, off the ice, off the court stuff that we sports fans obsess over. Do we even like the games themselves as much as we like all the scuttlebutt and rumor and whatnot in the uh, in the internet sphere has has that part of the, the transformation of media led to perhaps unintended consequences. So I'll explore that in just a segment. Until then, you're listening to Geek's Got Game and enjoy some local music from one of our artists that we like to feature here on the River's Edge each and every day. And a reminder that we are streaming live and local music 24/7 at River's Edge PGH. Dot com. Hey everybody out there, this is Mike Sasson, stand-up comedian, broadcaster, all-around great guy. Starting July 19th, guess what you're going to get? That's right, another white guy's opinion. It's the Michael Sasson Show. It's going to be premiering July 19th at 10 a.m. here on The River's Edge, a new kind of radio. Welcome back to... Geek's Got Game on the River's Edge. That was I Don't Love You Anymore from the album Jumping Out of Windows. And uh, again, I remind you that 24-7 we are streaming something, whether it be music, that's most of the time, or talk, that's part of the time, but a big part of what we do here at River's Edge. And hello on Facebook Live as well, on the live stream, on YouTube eventually, on SoundCloud, so many ways to access our programming here. That's the talk programming that I'm talking about. Uh, But the music plays all day long at riversedgepgh.com. And I'm your host, Matt Geica. Again, I'm with DK Pittsburgh Sports. If you're watching on video, you can see my uh, lovely company merchandise. So no one can say I'm not a good shill as well uh, as a reporter slash analyst slash podcaster. And it's great to be with you here. Once a week, every Friday, the show plays live at 8 a.m., and then it's available in all those forms that I told you about. Yes, back from the winter meetings, and I have to say, as a new father, I expected that uh, I would really enjoy being uh, away from the little one in at least one way. I'm talking about sleep and sleeping through the night, but uh, I find myself back here, and I woke up twice last night to uh, feed our little son, Lucas, and... I find myself more refreshed than ever on this Friday morning, so figure that one out. I don't know. Maybe it's just the, the great coffee that I, that I brewed up, and shout out to my grade school and my uh, old parish back in Weirton, West Virginia, Sacred Heart of Mary. I've taken to drinking some bulletproof coffee, as it called. Don't cringe too much, but it's coffee, but blended in with coconut oil and organic butter. So there you go, some fat with your caffeine. And I have to say, it works like a charm. I tried to create it on the road this week, and uh, I was trying to shake it up because I didn't have a blender in which to do it, and it just wasn't the same, let me tell you that. And also the coffee, you know, the coffee on the road is never that great, especially the hotel coffee. And I wasn't about to pay for any of uh, the, the Starbucks coffee there in the residence in lobby in Alexandria, Virginia. So... I suppose you get what you pay for, and I had that coming to me. But back home, um, I don't know if it has anything to do with just being comfortable and and seeing my son again, uh, the psychological benefit or the chemical benefit of the coffee that uh, that I've really enjoyed. Ever since the start of November, I'm always one to tinker and, and try different things. So that's why I was so fascinated by some research that I stumbled upon, in fact, the uh, the CEO of a tech company approached me to, to write a story about the, the research that was unveiled at the winter meetings, MLB winter meetings I'm talking about, for the sport of baseball. There was a study done uh, using this CEO's product, which is called the Whoop Strap. You attach it to your wrist uh, like a watch, and it monitors, I don't want to say your vital signs, but it does monitor your heart rate, your 
heart rate variability, which is the amount of time between heartbeats. Apparently, more variability means a, a better level of cardiovascular fitness. Temperature of the skin, uh, tactile response of the skin, uh, some stuff I didn't quite understand how it was tied into how your body's feeling, how you're recovering, how you slept, that sort of thing. But uh, the benefits of recovery are a little bit more definite after this study came out, and I think it was nine major league organizations had their minor leaguers put these whoop straps on during last baseball season, and two things that were really interesting emerged from it. Number one, the uh, the cost of travel. When you go on the road, most major league, or pardon me, minor league athletes who took this study, but professional baseball players nonetheless, so among the best in their profession, even they, when they go on the road, when they travel, they don't return to their pre-travel baselines in terms of recovery and readiness to absorb stress until two days later. So if you always feel like you're not quite yourself when you travel, even when it's not across time zones, just like I did, I drove down to Washington, about a four-hour ride, if you don't feel like yourself, especially that first day, don't feel bad because professional athletes feel the same way. And it is a real thing. Your body does not recover until maybe even two days down the road. And you can imagine that effect is exacerbated if you go different time zones, if you're on a plane, which has been notorious, air travel has been notorious for drying the body out, dehydrating you. So that doesn't help recovery either. So there was that. That really hit home. And uh, you could have as much of a 10 or a 20% performance drop athletically if you're not recovered uh, because of travel. So there was that aspect to it. And also something that might affect baseball in specific, which is that the study found that starting pitchers were fully recovered three days on average past their previous outing. Now, if you follow baseball at all, you know we have five-man rotations. So you get four days of rest that three plus an extra one. But this hasn't always been the case. In years past in baseball, you only have to go back to, I think, the the 80s was the last time that four men rotations were in vogue. So perhaps we can go back to that, and maybe there isn't that much of of a down effect to having starting pitchers come back after three days rest. And for teams like, oh, I don't know, the Pittsburgh Pirates of 2017, who may not have that many reliable starting options, A four-man rotation wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Now, you could have attrition at the end of the year if you pile up more innings than these guys are used to pitching. So perhaps it's not a true four-man rotation. Maybe you work in some spot starts in order to keep everybody fresh by the end of the year. But that's some pretty significant research to say that pitchers are fully recovered after three days instead of four. That could be a real game-changer, if you will. So uh, that was exciting to hear about. But I think... The aspect that most baseball fans, most of our readers, our subscribers at DKPittsburghSports.com were looking for from me from the winter meetings uh, was reports on not just legitimate movements, but also rumors. People love that stuff. They love to know what type of roster movement might be going on, and I understand that. You want to feel like you have your ear to the ground as a fan, so you follow me and you follow other people in the industry, and I have to say, boy, these national reporters get these stories. It's definitely a, uh, a feeding situation from the front offices. They have their favorites, like your John Heyman's, your Ken Rosenthal's, your John Paul Morosi's, your Jeff Passens, all these gentlemen, and there are some ladies too out there, but uh, mostly men, mostly white, a uh, pretty homogenous industry, if, <laughs> if uh, you don't mind me saying so. But most of these people in this small group, that's where these stories get leaked to, and uh, heck, I'm following them too to see where I should go, to where I should point my antenna in order to find out more from a local perspective. But we have this desire to to be on top of things, and I think the internet, Twitter, social media has sped up that process. used to be you had to wait until the next day's paper to get your rumors, and you could own that story, so to speak, if you were a reporter for a day. But now you only own it for... Uh, as long as someone else can confirm it who saw it on Twitter just a couple of moments ago. So it speeds things up. It uh, puts more of an urgency on being urgent, and in some cases that can harm accuracy. But fans don't seem to care. They'll eat up the erroneous trade reports 
or even in some cases made up things from people who aren't even there, don't even know, but just want to get some attention. That happens too, believe it or not. But all these reports that are out there are eaten up, and uh, our appetite is only becoming more voracious as time moves along and as our media consumption gets more and more immediate. So there you have it. And I think, and I've talked about this or I've touched on this before on this program in the past, but I'm starting to think that the offseason is even more popular or even more of a, uh, a clicks and reads generator for us in the media business than the games themselves because think about it. You can watch the highlights on your own. You can check out the, uh, the games on league websites, but what can we provide the independent media, away from league and team. Well, we'll give you the stuff that the league and team don't want to leak out, or uh, at least they don't want it leaked out on official channels. And so where does most of that stuff come from? It's free agent signings and negotiations. It's trade talks. It's uh, all that stuff that peaks in the offseason as opposed to the regular season. It does during trade deadline periods and the lead-up to that, too, But it's really interesting. I think most sports fans, uh, if I may make that leap, are more plugged into the soap opera and the where he might go and the he said, he said type of uh, stories. And I've never been like that as a sports fan, as, as as a media member now, as a reporter, as an analyst. I like what goes on. Uh, between the whistles, between the buzzers, if you will, in baseball, after the first pitch, and before the final out. That is what attracted me to the to the sport first, not who's going to sign where or which GM is going to make a big trade. That's all fun and games, and that's icing on the cake for me, but uh, those are two cliches that I stack back-to-back. I may have to slap myself in the, the next break here, the next musical break on the River's Edge. I did not get into watching sports because of the ancillary stuff. I like the games. I still like the games. And even though I I find myself lapsing into chasing the the latest trade report or free agent rumor, I hope I always stay that way. And I hope I'm always more interested in in what goes on uh, during the games. And that's why I'm doing this independent study on my own as part of my work at DKPittsburghSports.com. I have a weekly feature called Matt Stats. I want to generate my own stat. I want to do my own research, and give people their own insight. They can't get anywhere else, so I'm tracking the Penguins' neutral zone play. Well, actually, they're all ice play, all 200 feet over the course of this 2016-17 season. I am tracking their success, going back and watching all these games, in some cases for a second time, and seeing how they break out of their zone and how they enter into the opposing zone. Is it with control of the puck? Is it not with control of the puck? Labor-intensive, yes, but I feel like I know the sport and I know the game a lot better, and I ask better questions when I do go cover Penguins practice on the rare occasion that I'm called into duty there. But more relevantly, when I'm asked to analyze what's going on, I have a better understanding, not because I'm trying to dig up where the Penguins might send Marc-Andre Fleury, because you know what? That's going to happen. And no matter what we may find out on the outside... We can't do anything about it in the meantime. We can uh, try to report on the, the trade talks if that's our job. But uh, And if Mark andre is even going to be traded, it could be Matt Murray, as uh, I discussed on a previous episode of this show. But neither here nor there. What goes on in the games is the most vibrant part of it for me and the most immediate part. And uh, that's what everyone's watching. That's what everyone wants to, to know. How can the Penguins play better and how can they... Get out of a slump if they're in one. How can they maintain a hot streak if they are in one? And uh, that's where I feel like the most relevant uh, research and and study can be done, not on who's going where or what's going to happen in the offseason or before the trade deadline. That's just my opinion, but that's what I'm attracted to the most. Why are things happening the way they are during the games? Take a step back on Geik Scott Game and bring it on back. For the final segment, in fact, a bit of an abbreviated episode. I'm flying solo here. No Brian Crawford to hold my hand engineering-wise, but glad to have you along. And uh, so I'll just do three segments to keep it simple, and I'll come back with both ban slash kill the cliche. I just mentioned I should be banning myself maybe uh, with a couple of slip-ups this morning. And also what I 
hyped at the beginning of the episode. An homage to one of my childhood heroes still doing it in the context of the final number. This is Geek's Got Game, and this is The River's Edge, found at riversedgepgh.com. Stay clear of the streets, for God's sake! The timid in the fearful drivers are every bit as bad as the aggressive drivers. Nobody in Pittsburgh knows what a right-of-way is. I go down the road and I just sing this song, the gas is on the right, the gas is on the right, hi-ho the highway, yo! The gas is on the right. Get educated with Brian Crawford live Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. here on the River's Edge. Final segment of Geek Scott Game on the River's Edge. Thank you for tuning in again. And hello to all of our Facebook Live viewers. Fun to be part of that vibrant scene. And uh, I know that I've seen the commercials for Facebook Live. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, and friends are wanting to make everyone TV stars. I don't know if we're all cut out for it. I'm not sure... Uh, what the logical end is, but hey, it's a whole brave new world, and and we're part of it here at the River's Edge. And um, it's honestly great to be with you once again as we break down the the games and the moments and the, uh, as I was talking about, the rumors that we love to follow so much every week on this program and uh, thanks to brian crawford for his assistance from afar today miss having him here in studio on the ones and twos but i'm sure we'll be reunited at some point soon time to wrap up this week's show and i've got my two recurring segments stacked back to back so try to contain your excitement it is ban the cliche first of all and uh, i said this earlier when i was speaking about how the reporting sausage gets made, especially at an event like the winter meetings. You often see, and and I use this term as well, but I wish there were a better way, or we as an industry of reporters could find a better way to describe what I'm about to lay out. You often hear and see sources say, or a source tells me, a a source close to the situation, etc., etc., it never really makes it sound like it's an actual human being when you say, Uh, I heard from a source. I prefer to say I heard from a person or um, perhaps even be more specific. If I heard it from an agent, then I'll say I heard it from an agent or I heard it from an executive or a player, so on and so forth. Number one, because I think the reader or the the listener or the viewer appreciates the specificity there and uh, not just imagining some deep throat-like figure in a parking garage whispering things to Sports reporters, it doesn't go that way often. First of all, we usually get everything via the, the text. It's not even a phone call anymore. It's, it's usually a text, which does speed up the process and allows you to juggle some plates or spin some plates, juggle some balls. I'm even messing up my own terrible cliches today, but, well, I guess that's how it goes. I'll blame this one on the, the lack of sleep from the baby, uh, even though I just told you I feel great this morning, honestly. It's it's uh, quite the, the miracle. Four straight days of full sleep in in D.C., and then one interrupted night here in Pittsburgh, and and this is the best I've felt all week. But again, uh, try to explain all of that. And I will try to continue to not use uh, the word source too much. Sometimes it's unavoidable. You don't want to repeat yourself too much. Uh, But I don't know how we, as a journalism industry, started using the word source, I think we could probably find better ways to do it. As I mentioned, sometimes be more specific, and in the cases when it's super sensitive, just say a person with knowledge, or a person who knows, a person close to the situation, etc., etc. And uh, I think we'll all be better for it. It'll be closer to truth and transparency in language, which is what I like to espouse here on Geek's Got Game, especially in the band The Cliché segment. And on to our final number. If you were watching the Penguins game on Thursday night, a rather dominant win over the Panthers down in Sunrise, Florida. But you saw Yarmir Yager, the uh, one-time, long-time Penguin, spent a decade plus in Pittsburgh plying his trade for the Penguins. And boy, was he spectacular there. Over the course of his 11 seasons with the Penguins, he had 439 goals, 640 assists, over 1,000 points. That alone would make him one of the all-time top NHL scorers ever. But since then, he has played with, now follow along with me, the New York Rangers for four years, the Washington Capitals for three years. That's where he was traded from the Penguins, you might remember, in 2001. 
He also suited up for the Boston Bruins via a trade. The Philadelphia Flyers, unfortunately, the Dallas Stars, the New Jersey Devils, and the Florida Panthers. And he's working on his third season with the Panthers, parts of three seasons. He will turn 45 later on this year, uh, this season, this hockey year, if you will. And he scored goal number 755 last night on the power play for the Panthers uh, to give them a little bit of life to make it 3-1 in the second period. I told you the, the Penguins ended up dominating and winning by a 5-1 to one count. But so uh, Yager, again, a bright spot for Florida. It's been kind of a down year for him, 28 games and just 14 points. So his production is starting to peter out a bit. But at 45 or nearly 45, I don't know what we expect. He's already one of the 10 oldest skaters to ever dress in an NHL game. And he's already passed one of those guys who played long, long, long years, which was Gordy Howe, played into his 50s. In fact, skated a shift in his 50s and I think took a shift in the NHL in five different decades. So uh, that's rather remarkable. And uh, a tip of the cap to Gordy there. But I think we're seeing more and more players being able to stretch, not their primes, but their productive years further and further into their late 30s and early 40s because of nutrition and advanced science in the field of performance. Yager's taken advantage of that. But you look at these numbers, and that is what stands out to me. He is now uh, close to moving into second place overall on the all-time scoring list. He is just five short of Marc Messier, uh, I believe. Messier at 1,756 points. And uh, Yager is right there, five behind him. So, boy, it is... Uh, it's, it's getting close. Yager's about to move into second place behind only Wayne Gretzky. Messier at 1887 and Yager at 1882. So five away from a tie, six away from second place all by himself. He's not going to catch Wayne Gretzky, who is nearly 1,000 points yet ahead of Yager at 2,857. Gretzky combining the raw scoring might of Mario Lemieux with the uh, the duration of the career that Gordie Howe and Yarmir Yager are currently enjoying. And it's a, it's a credit to Gretzky. I always felt like um, you know, we, we tend to give him a hard time here in Pittsburgh because we feel like Mary Lemieux was the best player ever, and, and I'm on board with that. Gretzky does have the highest point per game total as well at 1.92, Mario at 1.88, second place. Uh, but uh, much of that mitigated by Mario at the end, not quite himself and, and his body starting to break down on him, his hip, his back. It was all there, and staying healthy is a skill, so I don't want to take anything away from Mer- from Wayne, rather, uh, but so much of his success was because he, he hung around, and, and he had a little bit more playing time, in fact, in the high-scoring 80s that Mer- than Mario did. Wayne th- played through the entire 80s. Mario joined up in 1984-85, of course. And Mario's line mate at one time, Mario's teammate for a long time, was Yarmir Yager. And there he is at 1882, my childhood hero, and I'm 31, so he was in his prime almost a decade into his career before I started to pick up on how great he was for the Pens when he was in those MVP form days in the late 90s and early 2000s. It was incredibly inspiring to see him play that way. I tried to play like him when I got on the ice, and... I don't know if I ever achieved any of that, but he was an inspiration to play hockey. And here he is, almost 20 years after I started following the Penguins, he is still playing. And for uh, the Florida Panthers, helping a a young team, perhaps, in in ways that only a a veteran of that many years could do so. And the one thing that uh, is a regret for me in watching Yager, and I wonder if it is for him too, He left to go get some tax-free money, some tax-free salaries in Russia for three seasons. So not that those years were wasted. He was still producing for Avangard Omsk of the, or what was once the Russian Super League. Now it's the Continental Hockey League. Yager was out there and uh, missed some time, which uh, at at the moment it it appeared to be he was going to finish his career (laughs) in Russia. But he's been back in the NHL for... Now this will be his seventh season after returning to the Philadelphia Flyers. Remember how close he came at age 39 to 
making a return to the Penguins. Maybe he'll finish his career for the Penguins. Who knows? It won't be anywhere near what he once was, but that would be something if we could see him again in black and gold. But either way, I appreciate seeing him in today's final number, this week's final number on Guy Scott game, 1882. That's how many points Yager has after scoring his 755th career NHL goal against the Penguins on Thursday night. What a career, what a human being, and uh, I hope my career in this business has the same type of longevity, proportionately speaking. I hope I do go beyond 45, and I'm pretty sure I will, but for an athlete, for a hockey player, maybe our most strenuous and rigorous sport physically uh, that's out there. Uh, I just I tip my helmet and I continue to marvel every time, especially the Penguins play the Panthers, and I'm able to watch each and every movement that he makes. Number 68, I again salute you as you once saluted after each and every goal uh, late in your Penguins career. Thank you for watching Geik Scott Game. Thank you for listening to Geik Scott Game. Don't want to discriminate against the live streamers on RiversEdgePGH.com. But uh, say hello to all the viewers on Facebook Live again. And uh, this will be up on YouTube, on SoundCloud, on demand. But uh, our most vibrant audience is live. And uh, we thank you for that. Again, Geik Scott Game every Friday from 8 to 9 a.m. Approximately. Going a little bit past the hour. Uh, this time, so hope you forgive me for taking up a little bit more of your TGIF merriment. Thanks to Brian Crawford for uh, producing the show from afar today. He's been a great help behind the scenes. Also, Tom Benoit for whenever he is able to chime in and, and provide his expertise on the board. I am Matt Geico, reminding you that when the radio fades, you know life's moving fast. I'll talk to you next week, same time, same place, at the Millville Studios in Millvale, and this is The River's Edge.